Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, here's the show you've tuned in to see. Hello, John. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Missing the All-Star game. Anyone care? That's here. That's right. It's here. It's tonight. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I want to talk about your fantastic book. Thank you for your servitude. Um, I, I tend to think of uh, a lot of people in, in media and in politics as... Uh, the, I think they take themselves too seriously and their work not seriously enough. Um, which is one of the reasons I've always been so grateful for your, journali your journalism, <laughs> because you're the reverse. <laughs> take you take your work very seriously, but you don't always take yourself seriously, and that, that comes through in a lot of your writing. That, that's important. That's yeah, <laughs> you strive for that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure that like not long after uh, the success of, of This Town, um, which is maybe the best book there is about the culture of, of Washington, D.C., um, you knew that you would write another book. I guess my first question is, when did you know that you were going to write this book? When did you know that it was going to be about how the Republican Party went full MAGA? It, it was um, pretty late in the game, actually. I thought, you know, there was a, se there was a sequel to be done on mm -hmm. this town because Washington changed utterly, especially in the Trump years. But one of the things that struck me about the Trump years, and I didn't fully realize it at the time, but... The swamp was perfected under Donald Trump. I mean, not drained, perfected. I mean, it was, I mean, the idea that like basically pardons were for sale, the idea that, you know, the son-in-law, the daughter, like the first hires. Um, it, it was just the essence of cronyism. It is everything that we assumed was like the cartoon version of Washington um, was just sort of brought to fruition. I mean, the, the Trump Hotel, which is a, recurring motif and sort of set piece throughout the, the, the book is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's Rick's cafe. It's like the bribery is going on in plain sight. I mean, you have Republican members of Congress um, spending tens of thousands of their own campaign money to line the pockets of not only the owner of the hotel, but the president of the United States. And he would keep track of who's in there spending money at my place. I mean, it was stunning. I mean, it's just it's like... It's so wild, because I, I did not go back to D.C. much at all during the Trump years. And when I went a couple months ago, like, the only indication that anything had happened over the last four years yeah. is that Trump hotel sitting there, which I know now it, is getting sold. Well, but it was such yeah. a weird thing to look at. I'm like, I wonder what this place was like. It, it, it's, I mean, I, I don't want to overstate this, but I don't think I can, because... <laughs> Um, this is not normally the kind of place I would hang out, but you can get a lot of work done there. A lot of reporters would hang out there, and it's a beautiful building. I mean, the old post, post office building, it's on Pennsylvania Avenue, was um, between the White House and the Capitol. And you'd go in there, and not only would you have cabinet members, some of whom lived there, like Rudy had a place there, and yeah, the Mnuchin, you know, Steve Mnuchin and his wife, who had this little, like, literal lap dog that she would carry around in her purse with her. Um, all these White House people, all these hangers on, all these sort of MAGA tourists, um, you know, Don Jr., Eric would be running around, Barron would be running around, the grandkids would be chasing around Barron. And then, you know, occasionally, well, more than occasionally, maybe like 35, 40 times, Trump himself would walk in. And, you know, he literally ate, he agreed to eat in one location outside the White House, and that was at his own steakhouse at the Trump Hotel. And, you know, the Obamas used to have these little discreet little uh, date nights where they'd maybe go in through the back, greet the kitchen staff, um, hopefully not be seen, but they usually were, and, you know, they'd come back in. 
um, you know, he needed the big applauded entrance, and you know, it was like seeing Cinderella at, at the castle, right? Um, you show up, and it's like, well, there he is, and it was wild. It was a totally wild scene. You know, people sitting on the or you know, standing on their chairs and applauding and chanting Trump, 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 and um, you know, it was everything you would have expected, or you know, for a Trump presidency to look like in a kind of perverse sense. But it took me a long time writing the book to know that the reason, the real story here, was not this Cinderella in the middle of the castle because that's done to death and everyone's written about Trump and a lot of White House intrigue has been aired. Um, it was not about the voters. Um, I didn't want to try to understand Trump voters any better than anyone else. It was about the people who hung out at the hotel who enabled him to keep happening. Many of them were elected officials. Many of them are some of those powerful Republicans in, in the country. I mean, Kevin McCarthy was a regular in there. Um, you know, uh, Lindsey Graham was always in there. You had just any number of members of Congress, Senate, and you know they were pleasing the boss. They were giving money to the boss, and um, it was just a bizarre scene. But I, I wanted to focus on the people who knew better, and that was always the working title of the book. They all knew better. So. I mean, so the central question of the book is is why all these Republicans, who uh, most of them who said publicly said terrible things about Trump during 2016, before 2016. Yeah. Um, most of them who said terrible things about Trump privately after 2016 mm -hmm. still chose to embrace him then and, and are still embracing him now. Like, and I know that humans are complicated and everyone's different, but like, have you arrived at a generalized theory? <laughs> um, well, okay, a few, a few th not theories, but, but certainly some recurring traits. I mean, I remember I spent a fair amount of time with Trump during the 16 campaign. I mean, access to him was not difficult back then, <laughs> um, certainly compared to Hillary or Obama. Right. I mean, yeah. he, he just like he just opened it up, and he had a very minimalist staff. It was him and Hope Hicks and maybe a couple of other people, and he just let you in. And he, he was not shy about letting himself be known or seen or spent time with. And, and at one point, we were on a plane from Dallas to, to L.A., and he said, you know what, I'm going to win. Um, and it was the, he had just come off a debate stage, uh, which actually, it, it was a debate, and we were going to another debate at the Reagan Library. He said, you know why I'm going to win? Because everyone up there with me is weak. And if there's one thing I know, it's how to find people who are weak and to exploit them. And I'm like, <laughs> whoa. And first of all, it was kind of self-aware. I mean, it was, yeah. oh, it, was, it was boastful, but you know, you expect him to be boastful. But it was, it was kind of more insightful than you expect him to be, or I expect him to be. So, um, um, and sure enough, like, all of his opponents, you know, they basically just folded their tents. I mean, they waved the white flag. I mean, it took them a while, but he exploited their weakness, and they all just came around. And you know, part of them are just terrified of losing re-election. So I mean, they need his voters. Um, part of them, some of them, just are weak. I mean, they they couldn't stand up to the guy, um, and um, it was a path of least resistance, and he kept surviving stuff. It always seemed in the primary. Uh, in the 2016 primary, like it was a collective action problem. Yeah, like yeah. they couldn't all, you know, if if Marco Rubio was the one to to take Trump out, then Trump takes Marco Rubio out, and then everyone piles on Rubio, and no one right. helps them. It like that that they never figured out a way to sort of work together to take him down, and therefore they all just yeah. I mean, I kind of like I don't know if I give him the path, but 2016 is different because you know he 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 had voters in the thrall of him, and you can't you know you can't like take away the will of the voters. And it's not like Ted Cruz is wired to say, OK, I'm going to give up my dream of being president to help Marco Rubio and for the good of the, I mean, it's just not how these people operate. So um, look, he, Trump had these solid supporters, and they, they made him the nomination, the, they made him the nominee, and people sort of held their nose through Access Hollywood and, and everything, and he won. And, but what I object to is how they just fell into line after he got into the White House, like the whole check and balance thing. I mean, they could have resigned. I mean, a lot of people like quit Congress, but they just sort of walked away. I mean, Paul Ryan walked away. Okay, he he was, you know, obviously didn't like him. Um, you know, either they walked away, they would speak privately about their contempt for him. They would claim to be an adult in the room. That that's yeah, we could talk about that. But it, I mean, there was a lot of. I, I thought the dereliction really kicked into gear when he was in the White House, and you know, they uh, they they. Let him do the Ukraine. I mean, you know, we know we know what he survived, but but the idea also, 
still can't believe this. I mean, it's like it's obvious. I'm going to say it anyway. The idea that he is still a viable political figure in the United States after January 6th is just incredible to me. And he why, is. Why do you think? Why do you think that is? And having now he, having now studied the Republican Party. Um, you <laughs> up know, close, or at least he, the official Republican Party. I mean, tr Trump's, it's, it's not a genius, but I mean, Trump just keeps going. And like, he's like Vladimir Putin. He's going to take what's given to him, right? And like, unless someone stops him, and, you know, first of all, he lost the election, okay? They, they, they don't love Joe Biden in the Republican Party. You know, oh, he lost Joe. And, you know, it's not like after Jimmy Carter got his ass kicked, he, like, people were like going down to Plains, Georgia to kiss the ring, or <laughs> George W. Or Herbert Walker Bush. I mean, it's like, that doesn't happen. I mean, they generally yeah. just go away. So then he behaves like a complete child. I mean, like the worst. I mean, we, we all lived through that. Um, and then the insurrection. I mean, it's like, it's an unspeakable act that happened. He got impeached again. Um, and Kevin McCarthy, eight days later, goes down to Mar-a-Lago. You know, McCarthy, or um, McConnell, despite condemning him in the, the harshest possible terms, basically orchestrated the second impeachment to occur after the inauguration, so everyone had their built-in answer, which is, um, well, why do we impeach a guy who's out of office anyway? So, you know, they got a pass there, and then, you know, next thing we know, McConnell's saying, well, of course I will support the nominee, and McCarthy's down at Mar-a-Lago, and, you know, and so we're back. So I always wonder, like, are they afraid of... Are they afraid of their voters? Do they think that their voters have been radicalized by the right-wing media and the people in the primetime Fox lineup and that those are the real bosses? Yeah. And, and you know, Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy are just sort of have to, have to do whatever the voters that are watching Fox every night want them to do. Maybe. I mean, I think you can't underestimate or can't understate the, um, the power of Fox here. I mean, I... I believe that Nixon could have survived Watergate if he had Fox in yeah. his pocket. I, I believe, you know, also probably wouldn't have hurt to have Kevin McCarthy um, and Lindsey. I mean, the, you know, it, I mean, ultimately the Republicans were the ones who walked over to the White House and said, okay, Mr. President, time's up. And, you know, and, and Nixon, despite his many demons, you know, actually did, he was capable of shame and, you know, patriotism and did walk away. I, I don't think Trump is, but it's a whole other story. But I, I think you know, Fox, uh, terror, and, and don't underestimate just like pure um, intimidation. I mean, there's a, mm. all kinds of great stories or very sort of powerful stories of backbencher Republicans who, um, you know, we were talking about this backstage. I mean, of course they're going to vote for certification. That's what people do. You vote, you know, there's no reason not to vote for, I mean, a couple have been isolated cases here and there, but, um, but you know, they're all getting death threats. I mean, they're like, I can't like go out there and vote against, uh, vote for certification because you know my family's in danger, and like these are not people with security details, are not used to like taking physical risks. I mean, because this is America, this isn't supposed to happen. But you know, next thing you know, Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and Trump himself and like Jim Jordan are like saying, okay, this is the new litmus test, and and the, you know the threats are coming in. They're all, they're just and you know people just sort of fold, right? Yeah. Well, there's also I'm sure. I'm sure the rationalization to yourself is, okay, I'm, I'm getting these threats, I'm feeling intimidated, yeah. I'll, I'll vote against certification. I know that we don't have the votes to decertify right. the election, right. so it's not really says. gonna mean anything. Right. So if I, if I just do it, what does it really matter? Yeah. But this is, I mean, you, you and I were talking, I think that like, the, in, in many ways, the Republican Party doesn't have to be devious or clever that they can stumble ass backwards into, into authoritarianism, authoritarianism, which they almost yes. did on January 6th. I exactly. And, and it's, you know, it's worth pointing out, I mean, that this, what I just described, what we're describing here is, is the essence of authoritarianism. It's not persuasion by debate, by politics, by argument. It's persuasion by just brute force intimidation. Yeah. You know? And the president, you know, I remember Mitt Romney said this to me, I think I quoted him in the book. He, he said, um, you know, as a public figure, one of the first things you learn is don't say something that's going to, um, you know, excite the random nut out there, you know, like, because you, you don't want to, like, excite people who are irresponsible, because, you know, people are a little, you know, people are, are dangerous and erratic, and you don't want to, like, you don't want to trigger them, and, and um, you know, obviously Trump doesn't have that concern. I mean, yeah. he, will, he will weaponize the mob, as, as he did, you know, literally. Romney said something else too in the book um, about his fellow Republicans. He said, none of their grievances appeared to be grounded in any set of ideas and certainly not conservatism as Romney knew it. It was pure yeah. tribalism. Yeah. Do you get the sense from others that policy 
or ideological goals were reasons that Republicans put up with Trump's bullshit as long as they did, like, you know, it, they did it for the judges, they did yeah. it for the tax cuts. Because I think at the beginning of the administration, right. that's sort of what I believed about a lot of these Republicans, is they were yeah. letting a lot of the behavior go because their dream of stacking the judiciary with right-wing judges and getting tax cuts and all these policy goals was about to come true with Donald Trump. Absolutely. They, they, there was a lot they got in the deal from a policy perspective. Now, I would argue that... You know, first of all, like, do you think Trump had heard of any of these judges? Like, like, no, he or he, cared. He, he worked off the you know, or cared. He worked off the heritage list. You know, Pence would have picked the same judges. Jeb would have picked the same judges. I mean, yeah, okay. So let's get a Republican in there. Now he had to win. So in order to get to choose, so yeah, you know, that's that's what enabled him to have that power. Same with the tax cut. I mean, they all would have done the same thing. And you know, Ryan probably gets the lion's share of credit for putting that through the House. McConnell for the judges, but. Um, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, Trump's only real superpower is that he won. It's not that, you know, he was a great conservative or anything. And, and he also, by the way, I always thought it was overstated what he actually delivered on for his, you know, for, for the members and for the base. I mean, didn't overturn Obamacare. It's going to be so easy. You know, it didn't happen. Uh, infrastructure, you know, had to wait for Biden for that. Um, you know, build a wall, Obama built more wall, didn't pay for, you know, you know the whole, go down the whole list. So. Well, I think what's interesting, though, is that it starts as this trade-off for these policy uh, goals. Yeah. That falls away rather quickly. I mean, McConnell's still stacking the judiciary the whole time. Yeah. But, and you mentioned this in the book, by the time you get to 2020, you get to the Republican convention, there is no Republican platform. Whatever Trump and I think, wants. And, mm -hmm. I, there's, and now I think the party is, like, there, if you look at any of the races now, any of these Republican Senate races, it's all vibes. Yeah. There's no, there's no, vibes. there's no yeah. policy True. agenda. These people aren't fighting for, you know, they've got their enemies mm -hmm. uh, that they, they list and, mm -hmm. and then we're not the enemies. Yeah. <laughs> we're the good guys, the Democrats and the immigrants yeah. and everyone else, they're the bad guys. And that's it. There's not like, there's, there's not much policy left of the Republican party. No, no. I mean, I mean, I don't know what Herschel Walker, I haven't, I haven't read his issue papers that closely. He had, he had, he had, he had you know, but, quite but, a quote about no, it, climate change. No, it's true. Change. You have all these knockoffs. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's possible, if not likely, that, that Trump will cough up a few Republican Senate seats. I mean, I think that's probably could save the Democrats in the Senate because, you know, he's, there are definitely, you know, some bad candidates out there that, that he was directly involved in in getting in the game. I mean, Dr. Oz and, and Herschel Walker being the, the two best examples. I mean, J.D. Vance, probably a better candidate and yeah. probably an easier path. But, um, but yeah, no, it, it's, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't see like the, um, all right, we're going to have a reckoning here and we're going to return to the party of Reagan. I mean, I, there was this piece, <laughs> that Larry, I did a piece on Larry Hogan a few weeks ago, the governor of Maryland, who's definitely anti-Trump, and he gave a speech at the Reagan Library and he talked about how much he loves Ronald Reagan and how we have to return to Ronald Reagan and it's a time for choosing, which is the old Reagan line. Um, you know, we can't be the party of Trump, we have to be the party of Reagan. And like, I remember watching this, like I, it was on like C-SPAN or something, and then like on all the other three cable networks, J.D. Vance was giving his victory speech, like it was the same night. And it's like, I think the choice has been made here. <laughs> um, and you know, that's just like, yeah, this is the party now. And you know, I think Democrats- And all the incentives are- yeah, for that kind of for the for the Trumpian behavior. Yeah, it seems so. Yeah, I mean, you've interviewed and profiled a lot of these Republican politicians in the past, uh, who you talk about in the book. Like, who surprised you most in their embrace of Trump? In their embrace of Trump? Oh boy. Um, well, certainly Lindsay is. I mean, it's it's an easy answer just because. I mean, there, it's not hard to like find the clips from 2016. Both you know, Lindsay Cruz, Ruby. I mean, they all have the clips. Um, but. Talk about a guy who knows better, and 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 the ad, the added sort of um, whipped cream on the Sunday here with him is the McCain piece. I mean, his literally his best friend. Yeah, talk about that he, a little. Well, I mean, you know, Graham. Okay, so he, he's John McCain's sidekick. I mean, Lindsey Graham just loves. He always said this. I love alpha dogs, and you know, he grew up really poor in South Carolina, and his dad was his alpha dog. He was like the little mascot in the bar, and his name was Stinkball. Uh, it was his nickname in the bar. Uh, very good nickname, by the way. It was the name of the chapter. Um, someone should be nicknamed Steve. <laughs> um, but, you know, his dad was his alpha dog. He followed him everywhere. His dad died pretty young. Um, 
He gets to the Senate, John McCain was his alpha dog. You know, John McCain, and, and you know, and, and Graham's always seen himself as an entertainer, loves to laugh, loves to be the butt of jokes. I mean, he just sort of loves to be the guy that, that Trump uh, calls out his cell phone number and like, oh, look what happened to poor Lindsay here. And, and like, he just, he plays along. And he's the, like the gesture to the king. And McCain was the king and he sort of got him into these rooms and these war zones and into these, you know, he got him on TV. I mean, he was his guy. And McCain hated Trump, was never unshy about that. And then, you know, Trump, because He's Trump, you know, just trashed McCain all the way to the grave. Very, you know, was hesitant to, to all the lower way to the, the grave, flag. like and beyond. Right. I mean, and how did beyond he... didn't lower the flags until like veterans groups complained. I mean, just stunningly, and and you know, kept trashing him like within days of his death. I mean, he threw like a hissy fit because you know a bunch of his cabinet people went to the funeral because they, he thought it was disloyal and it's just bizarre. But. You know, Lindsay, I guess, at one point said that it was disturbing that the president was uh, speaking so disparagingly about his best friend who had just died. Um, and, you know, he was back golfing with him in two weeks. But, um, but it's weird. It, it's, I just don't get how you, this is like one of your best friends. Yeah. How do you not only like live with yourself, but live with like what you must imagine the public perception of, of, of you is? Because everyone knows that you were close with John McCain. They know that your new buddy literally was mocked him, like you said, to the grave and beyond. Yes. And you're just like, cool with that. Here is what he would say. <laughs> he would say, in South Carolina, where I'm up for re-election next year, um, or soon, next cycle, um, they love that I'm with the president every day on the golf course. They just love it. They love I'm working with, I've never been this popular among Republicans or anyone in South Carolina. So that's good. He, he The guy needs the Senate probably more than anyone else in the Senate. Um, and he likes it. His colleagues are saying, "Hey, Lindsay, can you get me like a, maybe get the president to tweet like a nice thing about my, you know, my new I don't know, just like can you get a birthday call?" I mean, so he was the guy, and it made him relevant. You know, that's Lindsay's favorite word. I want to be relevant, and relevant is you know he he not only lost his alpha dog best friend, but he traded up for the alpha dog who's the president of the United States, and he goes, "I really like his company." I'm like. Three weeks ago, he's like trashing your best friend. And, and, um, and he would say he doesn't care about like people mocking him. He, he cares about what the voters of South Carolina think, the respect of his colleagues, and being in the room. He says, I want to be at the dice table. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Um, I want to be like, you know, the White House is cool. I mean, that was another, that's the other under-mentioned part of this. Like Kevin McCarthy thinks it's cool that he gets called by the president. Like there's Jesus like all these gee whiz quotes in the book about from McCarthy, from Graham, about I'd never been called by a president so much in my life. And it's just like, whoa. <laughs> um, so yeah, but it's I think like, not that complicated. The, the, your discussion about relevance in the book is always, that word is, is like so sad to me because I feel like you can at least understand why people go into politics because they want power and the reason they want power mm -hmm. is because they want to be influential right like at the yeah. core you want to be in politics because you want to use influence you want to use persuasion to change people's minds mm -hmm. get people together and get stuff done yeah but relevance very passive only ha but rel is passive and it only has to do with you yeah it's absolutely. only you it's i have heard you. from people that graham because he's like older and single and mm -hmm. it's like he doesn't have much else he doesn't have in his else. life. This is a yeah. very sad thing than, than his is. job in the Senate. And so it's not your traditional view of a politician like power hungry and I have to keep this title because the title, it, it's, yeah. this is my, these are my friends and this is my job and I need to hang on because I don't have anything else. And it's like, sure. oh, so now all the rest of us have to get I was going to say, we, we, we have to suffer, right? <laughs> no, I, you know, I've heard that a lot. Um, you know, again, I didn't... I, I, I'm not a licensed psychiatrist. I cannot uh, <laughs> speak to Lindsay's motivation here. But no, I mean, he does know better. Clearly, he's a smart guy. He's, um, you know, he's ideological. I mean, he, he's ideologically pliable. He, he's certainly capable of compromising and joining these bipartisan gangs and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he definitely surprised me the most. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one, but it was just so over the top with him. For a lot of these Republicans, it seems like the one... One reason that they're willing to debase themselves so freely and willingly is because the only consequence of doing so is shame. Yeah. And they have learned from Trump that shame isn't a very useful attribute in politics anymore. Yeah. And apologizing is a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. And 
who cares what the media says because they're corrupt as hell anyway. Yeah. Is, that, is that some of the thinking? <laughs> yeah, I mean, shamelessness is a superpower. I mean, it, it is. I mean, it's, it's asymmetrical. I mean, I remember, um, remember, like, in 2016, everyone thought, like, you know, Hillary was bulletproof. I mean, the Clintons, they, you know, the yeah. vast white right-wing conspiracy has been trying to take them down for years, and they can't do it. Um, and um, I remember interviewing her, like, a few weeks before the 16 election, and she was unnerved. You could tell, like, she, either she knew something or sensed something, but she just had this scared vibe about her, not because Trump was, not because Trump was hurting her feelings, but because, you know, this potentially historic election of the first woman, you know, president, I mean, really the only barrier she was running, it was trying to, she wasn't breaking a barrier, she was the barrier. She was the barrier against this guy, and the stakes were just unspeakable. Like I said, basically at one point I said, do you ever think about, like, how big the stakes are? And he goes, I don't go there. And we weren't talking about the stakes, we were talking about her losing. Yeah. Like, and it wasn't just losing the presidential race, it was be, you're the guy that would lose to Donald Trump, and your staff is the staff that's going to lose to Donald Trump. And it was just real fear there, but also she knew that she was not playing with a equal partner because there was, you know, it was just a different set of rules with him, and he didn't get embarrassed, he didn't get ashamed, he could say anything, he didn't care about... I mean, the, the average person, if you're caught in a lie like he is, like, 900 times a day, I mean, you're embarrassed. Well, right? you're embarrassed because you get feedback and yeah. you get a lot of public feedback. And I yeah. wonder if this is another function of the right-wing media bubble is that it protects yeah. them from this feedback. Like, do they, do they I does. wonder if a lot of Republican politicians now even give a shit what the New York Times, CNN, no. the Atlantic, any of these other media outlets say about them because even if it's accurate, they have now conditioned their own voting base yeah. that because the media is a bunch of liars that it doesn't really matter if they say bad things about them because they're going to be lying anyway. Yeah, I mean, this is, Lindsay actually said this explicitly to me. We, we were, um, by the way, L Senator Graham, we are not on a first-name basis. I, that's a, a <laughs> yeah. tick. A Maybe tick, by the next book. No, a tick. A, no, it's for, <laughs> forgetting what I wrote about him. Like, there is a really annoying tick that the D.C. media does, and I just fell into it, so. <laughs> um, they do the first-name thing because they just do, so. Yeah. Don't be like me. Um, so he said, so he was, I followed Senator Graham to South Carolina, and he gives this really red meat speech at like some luncheon in near Greenville. And he's talking about like, they're denying President Trump his wall, not because they don't want a wall, but because they hate us. They hate you. Right. They hate me. They hate our way of life. So, you know, it's like pure populism. And then, you know, he basically, he didn't single me out, but he knew I was there and he said, um, he knew I was, I was posing the what happened to Lindsey Graham question because that's what everyone in Washington was asking for four years. And he, um, he kind of answered it. And he, you know, he was kind of conscious of it. And then, yeah, it was very nice afterwards. And then I was up in his office, I think two days later in Washington. And uh, he couldn't have been nicer. He said, see what I was doing here. I mean, he, he gives away the game really explicitly. And he said, what I was doing there is like, you know, you were like my foil. You were like, you know, the media. You were like the national media. And, you know, I know that like no one's going to watch. No one's no one going to read the New York Times in that room. And, you know, I sort of like, no one's going to read this book in that room probably. Um, <laughs> although I could give them free copies if they want. Uh, or signed copies. They have to pay for it. Um, but, you know, he, and then he sort of took me through, um, you know, how you work Trump. It's like, you know, okay, always do the, tell him Obama would do the opposite. You know, he loves that. He hates Obama. So that'll always work. Don't flatter him too much. Tell him you're with him like 85% of the time. So that'll get him working for something. And it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you're talking about him like he's like a problem toddler or anything. And he didn't care. It's like, he knew that, you know, either that, that Trump either was either was going to wasn't going to read that far in the story or his voters. It's sort of like the read. ultimate transactional relationship. Yeah. Right? No, I mean there is a <laughs> level of transparency there, I guess. Um, um, that was the other thing about Trump. I mean, his voters, to a person, kept saying, "Oh, you know, he's he's a truth teller," and you know, he, and Trump himself could be very very upfront about how full of shit he is, right? It's an irony, like the, the biggest liar in presidential history actually is known as a truth teller to a lot of people in his base, because I think he kind of has an affect of a truth teller in some ways. Well, I wonder if this is part of the appeal for all of them, because you talk about this in the book that everyone's in on the joke, yeah. right? Like clearly yeah. Graham is in on the joke, and, and Romney says that they're all in on the joke. Yeah. And it seems like Trump 
as might you were be. just saying earlier, is a little more self-aware than we might expect, and 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 he's maybe in on the joke too, and the voters are in on the joke. <laughs> like like they're all in. Yeah. on it. They all know. I that don't know it's if the voters are in on the joke. I Some of them are. I, yeah, I mean the thing of there are little clues that you get around that Trump knows what he's doing. Like remember Bill Barr's like memoir, which. I didn't buy, but I read excerpts. <laughs> um, he said that Trump always said, you got to put just enough crazy in the tweets. You know, which, you know, got to a level of, you know, calibration there, right? Um, I remember when I was with him, he was always, I mean, he knew where certain lines were. He'd go on and off the record all the time or try. And he would, you know, he'd go off the record and he'd like say wildly irresponsible things about other journalists, about his opponents that he would expect me to, I mean, I ignored them because they were just like smears, like absolutely irresponsible smears. And then he'd go back on the record and he'd say something slightly less irresponsible that wasn't like libelous. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's like he doesn't put stuff in emails. I mean, he knows where the lines are. So, you know, in a way it makes it worse. But I mean, I, I want to talk about the Trump administration officials a little bit because mm -hmm. the Republican politicians, like, they have to get votes, right? So that you, you can at least... Yeah. You know, attribute some of their behavior to trying to get votes. Mm -hmm. These these people who worked in the Trump White House and worked for the administration, like they were free to leave at any moment. Totally. But what you hear from them, you know, they're, we all remember early on in the Trump administration, they all leaked to Axios. There was like a a committee to save America, right? And it was all these yeah. Trump administration officials, and they were there because they wanted to prevent something worse from happening. Yeah. And then like you never heard from them. Like what were they prevented? Like then never we had an insurrection. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, so that exactly. didn't that didn't work out. But like you know, I think their rationalization usually is, "I'm only one person. Right. If I quit this job, someone worse is going to take my place. Also, I'm going to be destroyed. Like my reputation's going to be destroyed. You know, I'll. Well, I mean, I'm here to try to make sure that things don't go worse. Yeah. What do you sort of think about in your conversations with those with those folks? What I, I think. You know, I, I have very little patience for the adults in the room theory. I mean, I also think that a lot of people, especially like members of the House and Senate, Republicans, who claim to have like averted so much damage, probably overstate it. I think like McCarthy probably overstates his, um, his you know, tough talks he has with Trump like on January 6th. I mean, I just don't see it. Um, but, you know, I don't totally discard the, the, the power of, I mean, I, I would say this. And I, I hate to give him the benefit of the doubt here, but you know, in the la it, living in Washington, the the period between January sixth and January twentieth was about as scary a time as there was. I mean, you compare it to nine eleven, but you know, everyone knew that nine eleven was like some shady, probably enemy, and like you know, the, the government was working for us. You know, yeah. whatever you think about George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, they were doing their best to like stop like another attack. And you know, it looked like there were, there were gonna be a lot of them. It was really scary. But this time, like, you know, the, the, the scary dude was in the middle, was in the Oval Office and we know what he was doing. And then you heard like the land the plane types, meaning we just gotta get to January 20th. I mean, now that, yeah. now that we have failed on the peaceful transfer of power, we gotta get to January 20th. And, and you know, so there were land the plane types. There was, you know, Mark Milley, um, I mean, Barr wasn't there anymore, but, but um, McConnell, maybe, um, McCarthy, probably not. But Graham, from what I can tell, from what I can tell, actually made a contribution in those couple weeks. And it was like sort of helping keep the toddler in check. And he and Ivanka and um, not maybe Meadows, but not, I don't want to give him any credit at all. But like they were like, okay, we're gonna keep him feeling good about himself. We're gonna send him to the border. We'll do a little victory lap here and just keep him out of the office. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, so maybe there was a little bit of good there. But no, ultimately, if you go to work for him, you own him. And I think that all these people were responsible in some way. They all they were all partly responsible for what ends up happening on January sixth, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. I, it, it sort of hit me totally when I was watching um, the hearings and and Stephen Ayers, who was one of the rioters who was arrested, and he testified at the hearing, and he's sitting there and he's like, "Yeah, I mean, we didn't. Know, we were going to march to the Capitol because the president said march to the Capitol, and then if he had told us to leave earlier, we would have left earlier." And you're like, okay, that first that responsibility rests with Trump. Yeah. Yeah. But how many people around him were like, could have tried to stop it, could have said something, and yeah. were just like, yeah, we got, we got to wait. We got to wait till January 20th. We got to wait a couple. Of, let's just give him a little bit. Right. Let's humor him. Let's this humor was the him. Famous yeah, quote. well, that quote came like a few days after the election. So we're talking two months on. But by the way, the responsibility, okay, just got to just make, 
when does, the, the responsibility does rest with the riders. I mean, yes. you know, no one is, yeah, no one is easily led. Right. I mean, like, like uh, and, and I don't think the, the president told me to go, doesn't, hasn't seemed to be holding up as a good, you know, defense in court from, you know, from what we've seen so far. But no, I mean, look, I, I don't, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot there, but it, it's just really, um, I think ultimately Trump bears a lot of responsibility and, and, um, you know, I, I wish more people, you know, I wish they had like done a sort of closer 25th Amendment thing. I, maybe they never got close. Maybe they didn't have the stomach. It seems like they were at least talking about it. Probably just a lot of talk. Um, one of the most common refrains after 2016 was, this is how we got Trump. And, yeah. and, and this was usually something that like confirmed the priors of the person who said it, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, but whenever I look at the ass kissing, money grubbing, social climbing culture that you brilliantly portrayed in this town, I often think to myself, this is how we got Trump. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how, how much do you think Trump's success had to do with the Washington culture that you wrote about in that first book? Great, great question. I, I think a lot. I mean, I think, first of all, you know, Trump was not the first candidate to run against Washington. I mean, Obama ran against Washington, Bush ran against Washington, Clinton ran against Washington, Reagan ran against Washington. I mean, Washington's like an easy, like, whipping boy. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter that, you know, people, you know, the Senate, they, they attack Washington. I'm going to go clean up Washington, and then they don't leave, right? They, they get a lobbying gig, or they do everything they can to, you know, bust their term limits of vow, and, you know, they're, they're, they're there for life. Maybe they'll say, well, I'm splitting time between Washington and Fargo, meaning, like, <laughs> They'll, they'll do 99% in D.C. and 1%, maybe they'll go visit their mother or something like that. But, the, um, but you know, Trump, like Trump does, like turned the critique of Washington up to 11. He made it personal. He said, I'm sick of these guys with bad glasses and bad hair going on TV, talking like about how bad we are, these blood-sucking hedge fund guys. And like, like we have loaded language, by the way. Like, um, you know, he would talk about just like, he would trash Karl Rove. I mean, he really took it out there. I remember there was a, a campaign event in Dallas, like in maybe October, November of 15. And, um, you know, Dallas, I mean, George W. Bush's home, you know, Karl Rove's hometown. And, and he's just, Karl Rove said something kind of critical of Trump. And Trump decided to spend 15 minutes of his rally at the American Airlines Arena trashing Karl Rove, who's a total phony and who, <laughs> who hates me, and, like, and then the crowd's all whipped up, and it's like, all right, but this is part of the anti-Washington thing, and you know, he just did it in a more over-the-top kind of way. Um, and yeah, people hated Washington. People hated, I mean, the whole, like, the, the what was that, that stupid, um, you know, flight, so that that flight, the the one that crashed in Pennsylvania, you know that flight ninety three. Yeah, the one, you know, that whole like, okay, well, it's bad oh, anyway. The theory that, yeah, yeah, what do you have to lose, right? I mean, so there was that whole thing, um, and then there was the other thing, like, like you know, Trump is the murder weapon. You know, he might be someone that we don't like, but like he is stopping, you know, this horrific, corrupt system that he has in the most extreme possible ways just described for us. I mean, it was, as as someone who was on a campaign that ran against Washington as we did in 2008. Yeah. There we were always cognizant of the fact that like you can you can run against Washington to the extent where you want to change Washington, right? right? And, and yeah. make politics work. But there is a danger in so degrading our inst our political institutions right. that you unleash a populism. Right. That's that's out there that suddenly people want to just destroy those institutions altogether. Right. And all of the people you mentioned, whether it's Obama or Bush or other ones, there was sort of like a limit there. Totally. Because and of course it is it's an easy target, like you it's said, an and target. it is available to you but it's also to tell people that everything wrong yeah. with their lives is right. because of this this city and right. everyone is in it. Yeah. And if you tell them that enough and then you give them a whole other list of enemies too, as Trump did, yep. then eventually, you know, they're gonna, they're, something's gonna happen. And then of course, you know, he gets there and he, it's, it's, again, he perfects the swamp. I mean, it's just like, it's pretty amazing. So. What, what do you think it is about the Republican party specifically that made that party so vulnerable and such an easy mark for Donald Trump? I know we were talking about, so yeah. you, get, you get the like, can there be a democratic uh, version of Donald Trump all the time. Yeah. But I, to me, it's always sort of a backdoor way of, of, of asking, like, it's something about the Republican Party. It's not just like he, yeah. he happened to pick one. Well, I mean, he perfected, like, identity politics. I mean, white identity politics. 
politics and and um, you know it's a big identity group right I mean it's like it's not it's the biggest identity group in like America and if you get enough people feeling grievance around you know their demographic feature and their you know kind of depressed part of the country when their jobs are leaving you know it's a potent force especially when you couple it with the electoral college and the senate map and, and so forth so um, yeah I think the Republican I mean if you look at it I mean so what, like 65% of Republicans now think Biden's illegitimate, right? Or something way too high. I mean, okay. Um, and that tracks almost perfectly with the number of people in 2015, like seven years into the Obama administration, the, the number of Republicans who thought that he still wasn't born in the United States. Like, yeah. like the birther number, like, like again, like, really late into his presidency was really high among Republicans. So, you know, yes, okay, Trump stopped talking about it. I will not talk about this anymore. And so the media just stands down. I'm like, okay. Um, that always bugged me. Um, but he, um, yeah, but I mean, there was always, I mean, the, the bent for conspiracy and believing that stuff was always really high. And I think... And it was, like, and it was a straight line from Richard Nixon. There's yeah. been a strand in the party. Yeah, you know? it was. And, and, you know, but until Trump, people, like, pushed back against it. I mean, they knew it was irresponsible. He, he like, just blew it up. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm going to talk about this. You know, I mean, he built his political career on the birther thing. I mean, yeah. um, I mean, you know, Trump is always, to me at least, I mean, just a guy I ignored. I mean, I didn't watch his shows. And I actually stayed in a couple of his hotels, like, over the course of my life. And, you know, they're quality properties, Listen to me, properties. Um, but no, they were, but I didn't, I didn't want to listen to him. And then, you know, so he was pretty harmless. And then all of a sudden the birther thing happened and he became less harmless. It's like, oh, okay, he's kind of evil. And then, yeah. but then, you know, he became, then he ran for president and we weren't allowed to talk about that anymore. Um, because um, he settled the question. It was something settled. we were all so. Well, know, we, had to, we had to fly the birth certificate out. Diff to Hawaii, yeah. Exactly. It, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big weekend. Amazing moment. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for putting that to rest. Yeah, no, we, that, then we, we made some great jokes, and that was the last we ever heard of Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was a, did, you, did you work on that routine? Yes. Of course. Yes, I did. It no, was I've been, I've been it was trying terrific. To, I've been, just, I always, by the way, I never bought that, like, oh, that's why he ran for president and won. Like, yeah. Oh, I, I still think about it. What do you think? I, that's, that yeah, follows it's, me around. It's, it's, too, it's too easy. <laughs> I mean, it, like, I, I sat at the, I did sit at the table behind him and watched him during yeah. the speech, and he was, he was not happy. Although I guess he was, yeah. he was even less happy with Seth Meyers, and he went up yes. to Seth afterwards and said, that was not, that that was not was very nasty. nice. That was, that very, was, that was very, very nasty. Nice. Yeah, he loves nice. But but that joke about Celebrity Apprentice, where he he said, "Oh, and then you fired Meatloaf, <laughs> and not Bill John." Yeah. Like Barack Obama loved that joke more than any other joke really? he'd ever told in it four was years. Really he well was done. like, "I am telling that joke." He was yeah. like warming it up. It was yeah. I'm glad he enjoyed it because he, <laughs> he saddled us with Donald Trump. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So there you yeah. go. Trying to pay. I'm still mm -hmm. paying my penance. Yeah, That's why I'm a nice work media. there, John. Um, so speaking of the Democrats, uh, you recently made some waves with a piece in the Atlantic yeah. about how Joe Biden is too old to run for president again. Mm -hmm. um, and you said it, you talked to, I think, 10 officials and unofficial yeah. Ad yeah. advisors about this, um, and most of whom, like Biden, but also said that he seems lately old. seems old. Yeah. Did they say whether they think he'll run again or whether they think he should? Um, a lot of them say they don't think he should, but they don't see another choice because I don't think they think that seems to be the answer. Kamala is not the <laughs> answer. I mean, I, I got that more explicitly than I had before, um, and uh, you know, I'm of the belief. And then I, 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 so I wrote this piece, and yeah, I just think it, it would just everyone's like, so Biden's big thing. And I remember he used to talk about this as vice president because no one really was talking about him as Obama's heir apparent. I mean, everyone sort of assumed, or most people sort of assumed it was going to be Hillary. Uh, I think Obama kind of thought that too. And, um, but Biden was always like, okay, whether I run or not, you know, you d don't take yourself out of play because you're, you're either on, on your way up right. in, this, in this business or you're on your way down. And as soon as you take yourself out of play, you know, you're a lame duck and people look at you differently. They don't take you as seriously. And I think he still thinks that. Um, but I would say that I think there'd be such a breath of fresh air for him, for the Democratic Party to just sort of throw it open. Um, it would just show that the party is, is not afraid of its future. Um, okay, you know, send Stacey Abrams and Gavin Newsom and John Fetterman and Chris Murphy and, you know, whoever, AOC out there. And, and 
Um, but yeah, he's, um, you know, he, he's going to be 80, 82 at the next election, 86 at the end. I mean, that's re sorry. I mean, I realize people age differently. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and people think that he's up to the job now. I mean, he doesn't, I mean, I think his aides get nervous when he speaks because I think he doesn't speak as well as he used to. Um, he's not the fiery orator that he used to be. And he doesn't sort of use the bully pulpit the way maybe he could have 20, 30 years ago. But, yeah, I mean, he's had a great career. The problem with Biden is that the absolute highlight of his career and the highlight of his service occurred in November of 2020 and really in the first six months. And he calmed the thing down. And um, then, you know, things went a little south. Yeah, I mean, look, I think having just watched Obama go through it, the job ages you tremendously. Absolutely. And he was a, a much younger guy. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, there was, look, there was an element of Biden's campaign in 2020 that was, I am the bridge to, yeah. the, to the next generation. He said that once. I, you know, yeah. and I also, of course, sympathize with, like, we're living in a time of fear, fear mm -hmm. of another Donald Trump term. And I, I do right. think that a lot of them in the White House genuinely think, like, okay, they, they, their question is, what's the plan if not Biden? Yeah. And not, not, no one has a very good answer. So they're like, Biden's the one, the only one that can beat Trump. Now, do I think that Biden's the only person in America that can beat a twice impeached 76 year old who's lost the popular vote yeah. twice? <laughs> I, I hope not. No, but I mean, the question is, who is it? I mean, I think one of the problems, I mean, okay, so Trump has really messed with the Republican Party's head, obviously. They're scared. You know, I remember talking to Kevin McCarthy during like about a year ago, and we were, I think, somewhere in Iowa, and he, and we were eating lunch, and every time Trump's name came up, he just looked like like a big <laughs> orange light fixture was about to fall on his head if he spoke at a turn. Like he was choosing his it's words. Probably carefully. an involuntary reaction at this point. It was just no. It was just like it was really. He got, and he'd say, "Why do you keep asking me about Trump?" I said, "I asked you two questions about Trump." And he goes, "Like stop asking me about this." And, and it was like kind of like it seemed kind of you know just like. Uh, it's just someone who's just been through trauma and is going to, he didn't want to go through this again. But the problem is it's made, so it's made Republicans risk averse. It's also made Democrats risk averse. And, and I think, you know, the reason Biden got nominated in 2020 is because electability, I hate that word, but it was by far the most important thing that, that voters in the primaries were, um, were looking to. And he scared the fewest people. He was familiar and he seemed like the best candidate to beat Trump. And lo and behold, he did. And so we're going to be safe. And it was smart to be safe because he won. Is that going to work again in four years? Like, I mean, you haven't, like, spent any time, like, fine. I mean, I, I get it. You know, Biden's job is not to, like, create a full employment service for the Democratic, <laughs> you know, presidential field. And remember David Axelrod used to, when, when, when you guys were in, um, there was a lot of, like, you guys are getting all this crap. Oh, you guys haven't, like, worked to, to replenish the bench. Like, you know, and... Yeah, I know. And, I'm like, and, oh, like remember, yeah, actually, you see we're in the middle of a financial crisis? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, you, you have to, like, find the next generation of leaders. And, like, I remember Axelrod said to me, he said, you know, we're not a, uh, a, a job fair for the Democratic <laughs> Party. <laughs> that was a really funny line. It kind of shut <laughs> me up. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I think it's quite dispiriting that, that like... That there could be a rematch in 2024, and um, I think well, I mean, it, so yeah. Trump seems like he's in. I uh, think so. Yeah, that's what he's gonna <laughs> do. like given everything you saw, reported on, wrote about in this book. Yeah. Like, do you see any chance of history not repeating itself in the Republican primary? Like, do you um, <laughs> if he runs, I think he wins. I mean, I think the DeSantis boom boomlet is. I, I don't buy it at all. I think I don't think he'll scale well at all. I think he. First of all, Republicans who served with him in Congress and Republican governors who serve with him now in the governor's association, they say he is a weird dude. Doesn't make eye contact, like so doesn't I, get, doesn't, he's like, he has anti-charm. Um, and he that new, the, is, that and, new, and, and can you imagine like taking that on the road? He's a terrible speaker. Imagine Trump just abusing him left and right. I mean, and you know, everyone's like, oh, he's Trump with a brain. First of all, I don't doubt that he's smarter than Trump, I guess. But, like, remember how he came up? I mean, you know, those stupid, like, Trump reading, like, Trump books about building a wall to his, like, infant. I mean, I mean, it worked. Got him elected in Florida. Um, but, <laughs> um, no, I, I have a feeling. I don't think he, I, I think he's, like, Scott Walker, Jeb Bush. I mean, all these, like, oh, he's the sure thing. I, I don't see that at all. I have been in the if Trump runs, he wins camp yeah, for, totally. like, a long time. I yeah. feel, like, recently... I started. I, I think that 
It could be temporary. I think the January 6th hearings have actually totally done Trump some political damage. Everyone's Absolutely. very focused on like what, what Merrick Garland's going to do and what DOJ is going to do, and I understand mm-hmm. that for sure. But I think that, that the political damage has been significant, at least. Yeah. And, and again, we don't know if it's temporary or not. Yeah. But I think there's an opening. Applause. Yeah, we were getting clapped for that. Um, yeah. I, think, I think there's an opening in the Republican Party. And I don't know if, like you said, if Ron DeSantis is the guy. I read yeah. that New Yorker profile of him, and I came away with... Yeah, he's smarter than I thought, mm-hmm. but he's also a bigger asshole than I thought. He it seems really, like he yeah, doesn't like people. No one likes him. Yep. Like, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the thing with Trump is Trump's an asshole too. But Trump's like he's got some some charisma, right? Yeah. He clearly has some kind of charisma that's working on some yeah, people. Yeah, totally. And I don't know if DeSantis has that. But if I were DeSantis, like, here's the thing: Trump runs. If Trump just says he's going to run again, I think right out of the gate, DeSantis has to make a case for not just why Ron DeSantis, but why not Donald Trump. And yeah. it, it doesn't have to be, it can be chance. explicit, but Can't it has to at name. least be implicit. It has to at least be like the Obama to Hillary yep. thing in the primary in 07 that it's like, we all love Donald Trump, of course, right. you know, he served the party and the country right. well, but now we're moving into the Hillary future. Hillary was a great first lady, but yeah. <laughs> Ron DeSantis is not Barack Obama. Uh, you knew Barack Obama. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't think he's. The, um, you know, I think, the Re- I mean, okay, so, I mean, she will win if she runs. I think Liz Cheney would get maybe what fifteen percent of the vote. But I think, yeah, you know, I think she'd be a great candidate. But for a Republican Party that doesn't exist, um, yeah. you know, I think she checks a lot of boxes. I think she's done a great job with the the commission. But I don't doesn't um, check a lot of their boxes. Though. Doesn't check a lot of their boxes. I mean, you know, the fact that Dick Cheney now is like a despised figure in the Republican Party. I mean, that tells you all you need to know. I mean, um, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. Like Mike Pence, like I mean, it's no. just not. That's the other thing. Okay, everyone's like, oh, I'm now having second. I don't. I mean, everyone's like, oh, half the Republican Party wants. Like that was true in '16 too. And you have a multi-candidate field. And I think that you know, I think this time it's it's DeSantis or no one. Either DeSantis probably. rises to the occasion or Trump gets it again. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Last question for me before we get to the audience. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I've always loved your writing and, and journalism is because you've been able to brilliantly capture the absurdity of politics in a wry, sardonic, fairly detached way. Thank you, yeah. As I read the last line of your book, Who's Going to Stop Him? Mm-hmm. I read that as more of a, a worried warning than, than a question. Like, yeah. how has your view of politics and journalism and your role in it changed over the Trump years between these books? Great, great question, really good question. Um, I'm just going to praise your question for a few minutes. If you, if you yeah, you have no. to answer. It's fine. Um, I, um, I remember we talked about this before this town came out, like almost 10 years ago. Mm. And because you were at the White House and I had you read it, and um, you had a critique. And the critique was that it was a little too cynical. And, you know, I, I've always come to my cynicism very honestly. I've been, I've been accused of being a cynic. This town was a cynical book. I did, I, though, after talking to you, I, I remember wrote in some like notes of hope. Maybe I had to like work hard for it, but no, I, I, I didn't want to be like a, the, the cynical guy necessarily, because I think I have always come to politics on some level as a reporter, obviously, but, but from a place of idealism. And the Trump era um, did something to me that I didn't expect, and that the the Trump era in a sort of perverse way made me realize how much I care Mm. about the country, what's being destroyed, what was being destroyed every day. I mean, people use terms like norms, right? Which was kind of a, it's kind of like a cynical, I mean, I don't know, it it was not used properly, but you know, I really missed the normalcy. I wish, I missed the functionality. I missed not being embarrassed um, taught meeting people from other countries. I missed having a president that didn't make everything absolutely worse by tweeting. Like, I mean, just like, I, I mean, it, and it was like, it was just such an extreme of how a party, not, not just the president, because I didn't care that much. I mean, I, I thought it was boring in some ways. Just how a party, you know, what a party can do, working in lockstep with you know, a very important cable network, right, and, and other forces. But I was like, wow, this really is at stake. And 
I actually care more. And, and you know, my last few years at the New York Times were difficult because, not difficult, I, I love the New York Times. I spent 16 years at the New York Times and made wonderful friends and I loved working there and, you know, did some good work there. But um, I did find that the square peg got a little bit squarer from the round hole of like the kind of both sides format when I was working for the paper. I wasn't working for the magazine at the end. And, you know, it's a pretty much button down format, right? And I think the combination of writing this allowed me to sort of find a voice and find a level of anger and, and even idealism, which is counterintuitive because, you know, these are very cynical times, but, you know, I, I, I feel much more willing to fight now, much freer to fight. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think the Trump years, and this almost sounds simplistic, but I'm, I'll say it anyway. I mean, I think it's just sort of underscored what matters and what I would like to have back. And I understand every reason people are frustrated by the, by the Democrats and by the Biden administration and why I, think the Biden, why I think Biden himself is in trouble politically, the Democrats are in trouble politically. Um, but, you know, I, I do cherish stuff that, that feels like it's either been lost or, or could be lost very soon. I knew you cared. No, I do. I care. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I know it's, 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 it's been, I think it has been a, it's been a clarifying four years for sure. I mean, I, yeah. like, look, since I, since we talked 10 years ago, I've certainly become darker mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> than I was then, but I haven't, I still haven't become cynical, right? Because I think there is a difference. Right. There's a difference between like being clear eyed about mm -hmm. the danger that we're in, which I think is immense. I think it's real. Um, but I think there's a difference between being clear eyed about that and then giving up or thinking it's a game and, I, and there's no part for me to play. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And it took me a while to sort of figure that out. But um, yeah, there is, I, I mean, there was a, I forgot who wrote this, but like there was some quote I saw recently about how, you know, there are a lot of people that I know in my life, and I'm one of them sometimes, that just walked around in a bad mood by, like, shit that's going on. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, a lot, a lot of stuff, really big stuff lately, like, you know, the road decision and, and like, you know, some of the gun, just, you know, just, like, stuff that isn't possible and the, just the frustration mounts. Um, you know, our, our work will not be done at the end of our lives. The work will continue, one would hope. It will not be done tonight when we're done talking here. And, you know, it, it's... It is ongoing, and, and you know you do need to sort of strategize how to best, you know, get boundaries from the news cycle. Otherwise, you'd live in total despair and misery. But I, I do, um, I don't know. I, I do. It feels like the fight is worth ha having. And, and I also, I'm a, become a bigger believer on like really sort of small scale grassroots kindness, um, grace. Um, um, you know, I, I thought like. We were talking about this backstage. I mean, the January 6th rioter guy, what was his name? Ayer or something? Stephen Ayer. Yeah. You know, I, I thought, like, his grace note of going over and apologizing to the cop, uh, the cops um, was a beautiful thing. And, you know, you can criticize that guy all you want. And uh, I still thought it was a beautiful thing. And I think, you know, I've never f have let myself get cynical to, like, the Biden model of um, just just playing, you know, the love with the level to the level of hate that, that Trump used to. I mean, maybe the I see the goodness in Mitch McConnell's heart, my goodness. Maybe that's a little too. I think it's a little much. A little yeah. much, but no, I, I think it's a noble cause, and I, I don't think that's the problem. Yeah, it's a it's a time to look for light wherever we can find it. You know. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think we're I think we're ready for some questions. Thanks. Um, loving the book, laughing out loud, listening to the audio. Oh, um, awesome. What have you observed in your reporting about what it's like to be raged at by Donald Trump? <laughs> because it seems like people will do anything to avoid that interpersonal moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, it does. I have heard like people draw parallels between, you know, especially working close to him um, and just like a, a dysfunctional family where you have like a, you know, an addict or some, somebody you just don't want to trigger, right? I mean, just someone at the top of the household. Uh, it sounds scary. I mean, he's capable of, of just real volcanic rage. And um, he's also, he can be really weirdly, like, subdued and, and, and like, kind of kitten-like in some ways. And I think, you know, it all kind of comes from, like, the same <laughs> workplace. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, he's a scary guy. I mean, he can, he is, I mean, he is, apparently there are ways to sort of, there are strategies to sort of defang him. I mean, I guess he doesn't like people going right back at him. He is not confrontational. Um, but you need really thick skin, and you basically need to kind of put blinders on to some degree. And I mean, I couldn't do it, but he, uh, yeah, it's a scary thing. You want to avoid it at all costs if you're a Republican, especially. So, I mean, from afar, it's kind of fun to watch. I mean, it's not, yeah, not, yeah. Not, not like him abusing someone, but like, you know, when there are things that like the January 6th Commission are doing that you just know is driving him crazy. I mean, that's fun. Yeah, that's a public service. That's a good yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you both for coming. Um, I mean, eventually there will be. No more Trump, right? Who knows how long that will be, but will the Republican Party revert to a pre-Trump era Republican Party, or is it permanently broken, or will it not matter because society's going to collapse? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, if society doesn't collapse, um, I, I don't see it reverting to anything. I mean, I think it's, I mean, first of all, we're okay, seven years in. I mean, that's a lot of, I mean, I think like, in 2020, I don't know what the updated numbers are, but like half of the Republican Congress either quit or lost, like by by like actually this is by like 2019. I mean like there were so many retirements and so many of them lost, and then so many of them said they weren't running again. So I mean that washed out a lot of these sort of pre-Trump Republicans right there, and you know it's not like they've been replaced by the Kumbaya Caucus either, right? I mean. Um, it's just become sort of a, a finer, uh, thicker reduction, cooking reference, of like Trumpiness. Like, you know, you get like, I don't know, Heidi Heitkamp is replaced by this guy, Kevin Kramer, and um, Josh Hawley replaces Claire McCaskill. I mean, no, those are pickups. Those are like, they, they beat Democrats. But like even, you know, uh, Bob Corker was replaced by, what's his name, Bill Haggerty, who, by the way, is a pretty moderate, he was chairman of Mitt Romney's campaign, but in order to like, be like Mr. Republican in Tennessee these days, he's gotta go and trash Mitt Romney on day one. So, I mean, you know, Kelly Leffler, same thing. She was like chairman of National Finance Chair, or Georgia Finance Chair or something, trashed Mitt Romney early on. Anyway, no, I don't see us going back. The incentives are all going the wrong way, is the problem. Totally. And I think, I like the, the a party doesn't change unless a party gets beaten and like beaten badly and beaten over and over again. Yeah. And it was, you know, Trump lost, but the election was so close and, you know, the House, you know, didn't go well. And so, like, yeah. it's just. The Senate it, could have done better for Democrats. And I mean, then, they were lucky to have, like, gotten those Georgia seats. And you look at the right wing media and it's like, what does Fox do when there's competition from Newsmax and OAN? Uh, they go. just make their lineup at primetime even crazier. Yep. You know, that's so. Uh, all the incentives are headed in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, in your reporting, do you ever have cases where you have the goods on someone, but you kind of like the person or have sympathy for them, and you hesitate to pull the trigger and do what you do? Um, it depends what the goods are. I mean, if the goods are really good, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> I, you know, I don't tend to, I, I mean, okay. I mean, there are like, I mean, I'm a human being and whether I like the person or not, like there are certain details that could be harmful, embarrassing that are ultimately not that relevant. Um, but like, no, if there's like, if the goods are like material to like this person's job and, and, and you know, I, I, and you make like, you know, when you're writing a story, you, you make a million decisions like that. But, you know, uh, you know, as a general rule, if, if, if the information is, 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 you know, correct and, and you're, you're solid behind it, you know, I'm going to use it. Hey, Mark, it's Gotham, by the way. Gotham! Yes. I can barely see you, but nice to see you. Um, this is Gotham, everybody. So I'm just curious, um, when, you know, in 2016, Hillary used that, that uh, line, it's, you know, I'm the only thing between you and the apocalypse, yeah. it was conceptual, it is no longer conceptual, we all <laughs> live through this, yeah. so the other side, I mean, my wife and I do this thing all the time, we're like, oh, like, if he wins, like, what do we do, where are we going to yeah. go, like, I'm just having gone through this, and you've had, I mean, what, what did, I don't want to, I know you said you're not a cynic and, you know. Yeah, I'm cynic, an idealist now, what's remember. What's on the other side of, of, this? of this? Especially with what's happened in the courts. Yeah. Like what sounds like it's going to happen in the midterms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so reasons for hope. You got any here? Um, <laughs> no, I, I think here's what's on the other side of this. Um, 
Uh, Republicans are by and large identified with some extremely unpopular issues. Um, you know, the Roe decision, for instance, or the Dobbs decision. Um, you know, gun control. I mean, the, 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 there's just like a whole set of issues that are, are going to lose a lot of voters. And, you know, eventually, I, I mean, I, it sounds like unfair and simplistic, but, you know, you just need to elect Democrats to the Senate. Um, the gerrymander, you need a president who can, you know, nominate judges and stuff. It, it's a real, there's a lot of work to do. But, um, but look, the apocalypse didn't start because Hillary lost. Um, you know, the Republicans have been kind of gaming a lot of this for a long, long time. I mean, the, the politics of sort of personal destruction were kind of invented well, by a lot of people, but yeah, Newt Gingrich really turned it up several notches. Um, yeah, Mitch McConnell, I mean, Mitch McConnell started stealing Supreme Court judges, right, or, or justices. I mean, so, you know, I, I think that eventually the, the voters have to, you know, just, just, I don't know, Democrats just have to get their act together. I think right now, Democrats do not have their act yeah. together. They need new candidates. They need candidates under the age of, I mean, I don't want to age anyone out, but let's say 65, okay? I mean, we, remember the despair, like after Kerry lost? Yeah, you I, was, Kerry. I, was on the, I was on that campaign. No one knew that, who Barack Obama was. I mean, the Republicans had the same despair when like Jimmy Carter, like after Watergate, right? And, you know, no one, I mean, Ronald Reagan was considered like an old scary dude. To, I, to even to Republicans. So. I, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine who worked, we worked in the White House together, and he was, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years, and he's like, I don't know, I think I might move the family, looking at passports, might move the family overseas, and I was like, where are you going to go? I hate that. You, I, the, you, and now this will get darker before everyone. it gets better, but I said, look, we are, the forces that gave rise to Donald Trump in this version of the Republican Party in the United States are not just uh, specific to the United States. We are now in a global struggle against right-wing populism and authoritarianism and autocracy that is sweeping across Europe and Asia and South America and everywhere else. And like, the only way it's gonna stop is not for us to escape it. Like, I, yeah. I told my friends, like, you can go buy a house somewhere, put up a big wall, hire some security guards, and then wake up every morning and what, read the news being awful, and then like just live with your family there for the rest of your life? Yeah. Or you can like, fight to make it better, right? And, yeah. you, and like the way to fight to make it better is like through democracy, which is frustrating, maddening, slow work, but it's work and but yeah, it's something to, to, other, to fight back with. Right, and the other thing is too, by the way, I mean, we were talking about this before. I mean, not everyone has to live in West Hollywood or Berkeley or, I mean, you know, move to Montana or something, <laughs> you know? I mean, young people, I mean, yeah. Not, yeah, if, I don't think anyone should move against their will, but I think, you know, they're, <laughs> they're like the numbers under 35 for Republicans have never been lower. Like demographically, the numbers of like new Republicans being created of, of a certain age is like through the floor. And it's just, they're losing it. They're losing more and more every day. And you know, a lot of the problem is just bunching in Park Slope in, you know, in California. Yeah. And so I, I don't know, it's not, I, I, I don't some think purple we, states. What, yeah, just like find a few states to move <laughs> to. There's my first solution. Yeah. We have two more questions. Um, speaking of democracy, um, we do a lot of texting for different campaigns, for DNC, Fetterman, I do a lot for Beto, and it comes up time and time again when you're texting to Democrats, of course, they're frustrated, and yeah. we all know we're on the verge of losing democracy, but it seems kind of okay. abstract, yeah. so like, what yeah. are, like I know all the pundits, I mean, you guys are talking about, we've got to tell the voters that they're going to be losing democracy or the Democrats, because the Republicans, of right. course, don't care, yeah. but um, can you say, both of you, a few, or you, John, you can wait to talk about it on your pod, um, if you <laughs> put some thought, but what are some bullet points that you can explain to the people what will happen in their daily life if we lose our democracy? I mean, I know we don't vote oh. anymore, but like, what are some bullet points that will affect the daily lives of people? Um, John, you want to give a sneak preview of your pod? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look, it's a, it's a great question it's because great question. I think that, um, so look, I've been doing a bunch of focus groups of voters for the, this season of the wilderness. And I ask every group of voters, and these are all sort of voters at the edge of the Democratic coalition, disillusioned young voters, Hispanic working class voters, disengaged Democrats. 
And I asked them, what are the issues that are covered too much and what are the issues that aren't covered enough? And when I say what issues are covered too much, first of all, they just say politics, you know, right. everyone fighting. Right. And a lot of them say January 6th, right? That they, they're sick of it. Too much. I, 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 and they yeah. say, Trump was responsible, it was awful, it was mm -hmm. bad, it was scary, but like enough mm -hmm. about it already. Yeah. And so what issues don't get covered enough? I can't pay my rent. Um, I can't afford my health care. Mm -hmm. I'm worried that I'm never going to own my own home. Um, I'm worried about the climate. I'm, and I'm worried about gun violence. And the way to uh, persuade people that democracy works and that democracy is worth it is to have a democracy that actually works, mm -hmm. that actually speaks to the needs in their lives. That, that if you are worried about something in your life, that you have a government that will make sure that you have opportunity, that you can you know, earn a living wage, to make sure that your kids are protected when they go to school. Like all, we have to make government seem less abstract and more that it is a, an urgent response to the concerns that people have in their everyday lives. And that's how to get people to defend democracy, not by talking about the abstract idea of democracy that a lot of us have the luxury of talking about, but talking about sort of the urgent needs in people's everyday lives. And that's, that's one thing I'm realizing as I, as I talk to more voters. Yeah. Yeah. Nice work. Yeah. And our last question for the evening. Uh, that was a very positive answer to the, the question. I, I was just wondering why in the whole evening Steve Bannon's name hasn't come up and <laughs> to what extent do you think Trump would have ever had a, any chance whatsoever uh, without him? Um, well, first of all, thank you for filling in that gap in the evening. We, we have now, <laughs> Bannon's name has now been mentioned. I don't know. I, I always thought that his his um, his role was kind of inflated. I don't I don't think he was a great political strategist. He didn't seem to do anything in the White House um, before he got fired. And you know, he's a great media personality for that space. I mean, he's he's a classic demagogue. Um, I you know, I think he's derivative, and and he. He used Trump like everyone else. I mean, after first of all, he, he got he got convicted, and then he used Trump to pardon him. And you know, because after Trump hated him for a while. So look, I, I don't I don't give him that much credit to be honest with you. I think he's a he's a really scary dude um, who has made this work for him. But I think a lot of people have. Um, so I don't know. I think I think he's a symptom more than the the problem. Thank you all for coming. This is Mark. Appreciate it.